What would you say is like your favorite novel or movie, or is there, is there a book? I find pastors who read nothing but the Bible and commentaries are pastors that have the most boring sermon on earth. <laughs> I have more non-biblical books than biblical books. I don't know which door is going to come in through. Hello, 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 welcome. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. We're going to have this conversation with the Bishop of the Lutheran Church in Malaysia. We think you'll enjoy listening to this conversation because that's what it is. And we'll be talking about what it means to be a leader in the Lutheran Church, but more importantly, what it means to be a Christian in this nation and to be involved in shaping this nation. We'll be talking about a very wide range of subjects. We'll be talking about Bishop Thomas Lowe, the bishop, but we will also be talking about members of the Lutheran churches in Malaysia and our relationship with the world around us. We thank you for your attention. When did you choose to call yourself a Christian? And why did you make that choice? At the time I was only about six years old. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so my parents saw that there is a church next door. My parents aren't Christian, but they have good opinion of the church, especially kids from the church would be much better behaved. So as I get not, the feeling you were not so well behaved. No. <laughs> me and my brothers, um, because we are from a family of nine of us, so you really cannot you know, keep track of us all the time. So it says, naughty kids must go to Sunday school. <laughs> all right, so me and my older brother, they sent us over next door. All right, and that was where I started my first encounter with the Christian faith. Mm. Uh, go through Sunday school from, you know, six year old right until 12 years old. I more or less already have put my faith in Christ mm. Uh, ever since I was very young, mm. my faith was very simple. Just go through Sunday school, read the Bible, we believe what the Bible says, uh, enjoy doing Bible quiz and stuff like that. Tell me, what made you choose to become a pastor, an ordained person? Mm. By 19, I was already teaching. Mm. I was speaking in church camps at a very young age. Mm. All right, yeah. and I was reading anything that I can get my whole hands on, and I will be attending any and every Bible study ever offered that, that I can go to. Right. All right. So, and I began to realize that yes, this is exactly what I would love to do for the rest of my life. This would not be a job, this would be a joy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, personal experiences, understanding about caring, mm. because we were basically youth. Mm. So we have that very good tradition in our youth fellowship. The older one would take care of the younger one. Mm. Just like my family, we have nine of us. The duty is very simple. Older one, take care of the younger one. So I started this culture in my family, continue in the church, taking care of the younger ones and things like that. And that is where I really find meaning in mm. what I do. So it was a very natural thing for me to just... And so if I might just uh, ask you to expand a little bit on that. Um, how did you become a Lutheran? Were there any surprises for you in Lutheran theology compared to other theologies? Because you were with students from many other streams. So when I went to seminary, uh, you just studied the Bible, all right? Lutheran studies only came uh, during my final year for all, uh, all denominations. Their own denomination would conduct one semester of their distinctive theology. Mm, mm. All right. So I only had one semester of Lutheran studies during my final year. But the advantage I had was that during my internship, uh, during the four years of my studies, I was interned under the American Lutheran missionaries. So I picked up a lot of the Lutheran distinctiveness in worship, in uh, theology from the missionaries. Okay. Yeah. 
And that was in Singapore? Or was in, that Singapore. in Singapore. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. So you interned at a church in Singapore? Yes. Okay. Redeemer Lutheran Church and uh, Queenstown Lutheran Church and Bedok Lutheran Church. And were they very um, youth dominated as well, like uh, the churches in Malaysia at that time? Not really. No. They, they were pretty conventional church with a good percentage mm. of adults and youth. Holy Light is quite an exceptional church. Okay. Yeah. You, you've, you know, by this time, you, you've made several choices. What was your family's response to you becoming a Christian pastor and so on? My mother would always follow my father. Right. Okay? My father, very practical man. The most practical, moral man. He's one of the most moral men I've ever met. Okay. Honest to a fault. To him, it's very simple. You are a polio victim. Mm -hmm. Okay? You are handicapped. It's going to be tough for you to get a job. Mm. All right? Now the church is offering you a scholarship to do your studies. You graduate as a pastor. You have a stable job. Go ahead. Wow. I don't think many, uh, many people who are ordained have that kind of story to tell. Yeah. I think this is a pretty unique story. My, my father <laughs> is very simple. He doesn't really bother much what religion you behave, yeah, you believe in. As long as you... Don't, in Chinese literal, kill people and set fire on people's house. It's fine. But uh, you do that with your sermons every time. <laughs> uh, he doesn't know that. <laughs> so, so it was a very practical reason. He okay. says, go. You know? <laughs> okay, okay. And so the church paid for my four years of studies in, in Trinity College. But what do you think that church members expect from their pastors? In fact, the expectation is more on myself. Mm. I'm here to nurture, to equip, to care and help you grow spiritually and draw you closer to God. I would see the expectation of my role. The pastoral role in the traditional sense is actually uh, the biggest spectrum of skills. You need to be able to relate to children, play with them, teach Sunday school, then you are supposed to be able to touch base with the youth, win them over, then able to teach Bible study to adults, and then to be able to talk to the senior citizens. So it is everything. It is more like they look at you that by your, by your teaching, by your preaching and the modeling of your life. But at the end of the day, as I look at it, it's all about relationship. If they have a good relationship with you, you can win them over by godliness, by your commitment, by the example of your servanthood. Mm. I think the rest would be just growing together. When did you get married and why? I came across this wonderful woman and then there was a certain kind of attraction it was not an easy relationship because our, both our situations are very unique. But one thing led to another. And by the time I was already about 56, when you're at that age, you don't go dating anymore. All right? Once you are interested and you want to start a relationship, it's getting married already. Mm. Okay. All right? You don't have that kind of... Uh, you know, you don't have the kind of, when you're a teenager, let's test the water. <laughs> you know, let us check out the market. <laughs> what are there available there? You know, at my age, I was, you know, I was already before, before Susan passed away, I was already ready to be married. I was ready to be married mm -hmm. for a long time. It's mm -hmm. just that she wasn't ready yet, but I was willing to work, uh, to wait. But at this time, when I finally found someone, and by the grace of God, I was able to persuade her mm. uh, when I proposed to her. Uh, she said yes. And uh, then everything was fast track because of me. I'm not getting any younger. Yes. All right. So I got married at 56. What would you say is like your favorite novel or movie? Or is there, is there a book? I find pastors who read nothing but the Bible and commentaries are pastors that have the most boring sermon on earth. <laughs> I read a lot of novels, 
um, I have more non-biblical books than biblical books. One of the things I recognize is that whether it's movies or novels, you can learn a lot from them in terms of communication. They are able to communicate a particular message in that medium in the most effective way that millions of people flock to them. So there must be something there. So I learned storytelling from novels by reading novels, reading comics, all right, by watching movies, communication. Then in all these movies that are classics or books that are classics, you find that they are classics for a particular reason is that they would discuss, dialogue, think through, act out on certain very basic denominator of the human experience. That everyone that reads the book, whether you are from the US, you are from China, you're from Malaysia, or you are from Pakistan, when you read the book, you can immediately connect. There must be a common human denominator that we can connect with, with human experience. The rest are just dressings, are just contacts. So I find that novels, comics, stories like this offers a very, very deep and profound insight of human nature, human experience, human failings, and you know, human potentials. Mm. So that is why I find that reading non-biblical materials is very, very crucial for us as a supplement of reading the Bible. What role do you think the church plays in shaping the nation? I think the role of the church in society has always remained the same. We need to be the conscience of society as to be able to speak out, to tell the difference between right and wrong to able to speak on things that has nothing to do with culture, ethnicity, or even religious tradition. Mm. Right and wrong, justice and injustice, human experience of fear, poverty, pain, insecurity. So as a church, we must always speak in our society with regards to such matter we must deal and engage with issues, not politics. Politics is only the context, the framework. We need to deal with the content of society, which is right, wrong about everything. So, and to be able to speak without conflict of interest, we need that separation between church and state.